It's a privilege to preach here at Waitara Church. It's something I do on a regular basis. I last preached here 25 years ago. So, <laughs> this morning, I want to talk about the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is not doing. The kingdom of heaven is being. And I'd like to start with a verse of scripture. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighbourhood. Tell them the kingdom is here. I'm, I'm a New Zealander. I'm a Kiwi. Um, yes, I know the joke about the Scotsman, the American, the Australian and the New Zealander are on a train. And the Scotsman had a really expensive bottle of whiskey. Took one sip and chucked it out the window. Turned around and said, lots more of that where I come from. The American had a, an orange, a lovely navel orange. Peeled it, ate one segment, chucked it out the window, said lots more of that where I come from. So the Australian turned around, picked up the New Zealander, chucked him out the window. <laughs> lots more of that where I come from. I obtained my Australian citizenship back in 2017. And I've lived in Australia for a significant part of my life, but as any intelligent rugby follower would do, I still support the All Blacks, so there's still some New Zealander there. And I was actually back in New Zealand last weekend. It was the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine conference, Australasian conference. And I went back to that conference and I discovered that New Zealanders are in the process of redefining their identity. I'm sure most of you remember the events of Friday the 15th of March, just a few months ago, when a young man walked into a mosque in Christchurch, fired off 100 rounds at least of ammunition, shot 100 people, 50 of them died as a result of that. I lived in Christchurch for 10 years, ministered there for eight years. I know the mosque on Deans Avenue really well. I know the mosque in Linwood quite well. And for New Zealanders to think that someone could simply walk into a mosque on Friday and randomly shoot people like that had a dramatic impact on the New Zealand psyche and about who we are. And the thing that worried a lot of New Zealanders and they were talking about at the conference I was at last weekend was that mosque could just as easily have been Island Seventh-day Adventist Church on a Sabbath morning, or it could have been Sprayden Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. It just happened to be a mosque. And part of that redefinition of our identity is being defined by our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. I don't know whether any of you noticed the polls just before the Australian election for Australia's preferred Prime Minister. Jacinda Ardern got 63 and Malcolm, sorry, what is, what's his name? Scott Morrison, I should say, got 24. But we won't go there. But Jacinda Ardern came out that Friday afternoon and she said it is clear that this is one of New Zealand's darkest days. Clearly what has happened here is an extraordinary, excuse me, an unprecedented act of violence. Many of those who will have been directly affected by this shootings may be migrants to New Zealand. They may even be refugees here. They have chosen to make New Zealand their home and it is their home, they are us. The person who perpetrated this violence against us is not. They have no place in New Zealand. There is no place in New Zealand for such an act of extreme and unprecedented violence, which this, clearly, this act clearly was. For now, my thoughts, and I'm sure the thoughts of all New Zealanders, are with those who have been affected and also with their families. And then a couple of days later she said, we were not chosen for this act of violence because we condone racism, because we are enclaved for ex are an enclave for extremism, extremism. We were chosen for that very fact that we are none of these things because we represent diversity, kindness, compassion, a home for those who share our values, refuge for those who need it. And those values, I can assure you, will not and cannot be shaken by this attack. They are us. And Susan Moore, when she commented on this in The Guardian, actually made the statement, here is an atheist showing that love will dismantle hate. And those three words, they are us, have started to become a core part of what it means to be a New Zealander, to mean, means to be a Kiwi. And in the midst of the tragedy, 
our Prime Minister was able to find a definition that helped us redetermine who we were. And as I struggled that Friday night, the weekend, as I was back in New Zealand last weekend, it rose with me, within me a challenge about what it means to be a citizen of the Kingdom of Heaven. I claim to be a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I claim to be a follower of God. What's it look like to be part of the Kingdom of Heaven? And when I was putting this sermon together, I was talking about it with, um, with my wife, Sonia. And she said, Paul, too often being part of the Kingdom of Heaven comes across as doing. Do this, do that, do something else. But as I looked at the New Testament, as I looked at the Bible, it's not about doing, it's about being. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he walked into his, into his home church, into the synagogue at Nazareth. That was the synagogue where he'd grown up. That was the church where he'd been part of the children's story down the front. That was the part where he'd done the equivalent of Pathfinders and JMVs, the rest of it. That was where Jesus had grown up. That was where he had learnt the Torah as a kid. That's where he would have gone through um, the equivalent of baptism. And he went back there at the start of his ministry. And if we look in the Bible, Luke chapter 4, if you go to the New Testament, there's the first four books of the New Testament. We actually refer to them as the Gospels. Tell the story of Jesus, their biography of Jesus. And there's Matthew, Mark and Luke. And in Luke chapter 14, so, sorry, Luke chapter 4, um, verses 18 and 19, Jesus turns in that synagogue. He goes, he's in there worshipping. And they ask him to do a scripture reading, just like the two girls did a scripture reading for us now. And he turned in the, book, in the book of Isaiah, a book that was written some 600 years before Jesus was born. And he read these words. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of, flight, of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus, right at the start of his ministry, defined what his ministry was going to be about. And he talks about his ministry as being something that makes a difference in the world. And interestingly enough, if you turn over to the, keep going to the next few verses, um, verses 20 and 21, which the girls read out for us just a few minutes ago. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of any, everyone in the synagogue were on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was not talking about some time that's going to happen way in the future. He wasn't talking about what was going to happen after the second coming. He was saying today, right now, right this minute, this passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. And interestingly, if you look at the Greek word in um, Luke chapter 4, verse 19, where it says the year of the Lord, the Greek word is actually the word epoch, where we get our English word epoch from. And it's not just a year, it defines a new time in history, a new definition of history. And it's a passage that, as a minister, I find challenging because too often as ministers, as conferences, we define what we're doing by numbers, by baptisms, by Bible studies, by tithe collecting. And while these things are not unimportant, if you look at the passage, Jesus did not find, define his ministry by numbers. He defined his ministry by being, by being who he was in a community of believers. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, when Matthew, the first of those gospel writers, the first biography of Jesus, defines what Jesus' ministry was all about. Matthew chapter, um, chapter 4 and verse 23. God's kingdom was his theme. That beginning right now, they were under God's government, a good government. He also healed people of their diseases and of the bad effects of their bad lives. And I really like the way Eugene Patterson puts out the bad effects of their bad lives because I'm the health director of a Greater Sydney Conference. 
and it's about helping people to overcome the bad effects of their bad lives. But Jesus says there very clearly that the kingdom starts now. Not in the future, but right now. Jesus came to proclaim that kingdom. Jesus didn't come so that I could have eternal life. Eternal life is a side effect of what Jesus did. Jesus came to bring about a kingdom of heaven right here and right now. And then just a few pages later, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 8. Matthew chapter 10, verse, sorry, verses 6 and 8. Jesus sends out his disciples and he gives them a commission. And he says, go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. And then what's he say? Tell them the kingdom is where? Not coming, but the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out the demons. You've been treated generously, so live generously. Tell them that the kingdom is here. That theme of the kingdom runs right through the New Testament. At the end of his ministry, once again in Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, right over towards the end of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, just before his crucifixion, Jesus delivers one last sermon. And that sermon con consists um, of three parables. And he's talking about what the kingdom of heaven looks like. First of all, he said the kingdom of heaven is like ten bridesmaids or ten virgins that have gone out waiting for a wedding to occur. And then he talks about the fact that it's like three servants who are given money to invest. And then finally he goes, the kingdom of heaven is like sheep and goats. And when the king comes back, he divides the sheep and the goats. And that goes on to say in Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 to 36. Then the kingdom will say to those on his right, those are the ones who are his followers who have chosen to follow him. Come you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was sick and you looked at me. I was looked after me, sorry, I was in prison and you came to visit me. And we look at that and we see a whole list of things to do. And sometimes as followers of Christ, it's almost like I get out the check pad and try to tick off the list. Yeah, I've done this, I've done that, I've done something else. But look at the response of the sheep. Look at the, the response of the followers of Jesus. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Lord, we haven't been checking these things off the checklist. When have we done these things? And God replies, I tell you, whenever you did one, this to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. For those who are in the kingdom of heaven, it's not about a checklist. It's simply who they are. They do it simply because they are followers of Jesus. It's part of their culture. It's part of who they are. The kingdom of heaven is not doing, it's being. After Jesus died and then rose again, the apostles or his disciples started a movement and they were joined by a young man called Saul who had initially been one of the fierce opponents of Jesus but became, then became one of his greatest followers. His name changed from Saul to Paul. And Paul talks about this experience. In the family, in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew or non-Jew, slave or free, male or female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus. And he talks about the freedom that comes with that relationship. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 and 26 this means we do not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. And I love the way that Eugene Patterson translates this too. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. And this is a kingdom of heaven where it doesn't matter how tall or how short I am, how good my English is, what my qualifications are, what my culture or what my ethnicity is. 
It is about the far more interesting things of being an original and living that life. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul goes on once more to describe it. This relationship with Christ being part of the kingdom. There is nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters into our lives and we become like him. This is being. This is being part of the kingdom of heaven where we stop and we allow God to come into our lives. And gradually, God coming into our lives causes a transformation. A bit like those of you who have been married for a number of years will recognise. Having a wife changes you to the extent that I'm standing up the front wearing a tie this morning. Being married changes you. And so it is with our relationship with God as we gradually get to know God more and more. We be changed and we become more and more like God. What does the kingdom of heaven look like for poor Meredith Rankin when I'm driving down the freeway on a Thursday morning and some stupid idiot changes lanes in a hurry and almost causes a dramatic accident? What does the kingdom of heaven look like for poor when my loving wife gives me directions? And I don't need directions, thank you very much. What does the kingdom of heaven look like when my youngest daughter rings up and says, Dad, promise you won't get angry. Dad, don't get angry. What's happened, Rachel? Dad, don't get angry. Um, Dad, on Thursday, I was backing the car out of a car park and I bumped into another car. And she'd rang me up because this was Tuesday and the person had shown up with a bill for $1,200 and she wanted me to pay it. I told her to go and talk to the insurance company. But what does the kingdom of heaven look like in those circumstances? What does the kingdom of heaven look like when the insurance company messes up my life insurance? And despite 13 telephone calls to the insurance company, they still haven't got it sorted out. What does the kingdom of heaven look like when I find out my sister's in a lesbian relationship? These are not abstract questions. These are what it means to be a follower of Christ. What does the kingdom of heaven look like for a church, for this church? I want to share with you a letter I received a couple of years ago from Narongo. Narongo comes from a town in New Zealand called Tauranga. And he says to me, I have just experienced the most amazing transformational process of my life. Out of 25,000 plus Maori in Tauranga Moana, I was the only one to register and graduate with pride and increased devotion, uh, increased devotion and a commitment to managing my health in a new way. It's not easy as a Maori, I assure you, going into a place full of non-Maori with all my bias and prejudices. I soon distinguished that atherosclerosis, diabetes, hypertension, cancer and obesity has no respect for culture, religion or creed. I found the most caring and supportive Chip family and I am blessed. I even attended church the Saturday after my graduation and that was the first to overcome my fear of, rela of religion. I took off like a rocket after my graduation I went and spoke to the Maori leaders on my marae and I've got to tell you how hard that was with a concrete mindset. The CHIP team were outstanding, led by Dr Varty, Rose and Alan, the directors. In my life experience of religion, I waited to be pounced on and the hardcore religiosity to come out. It never came. I thought maybe at graduation I'll be ambushed. It never came. I found genuine people who cared and were open and embracing and allowed me the privilege of experiencing my freedom of choice. I came to church and met a church family of like mind, like heart, like spirit. Get this, Dr Rankin. I have agreed to audition for the children's mid-Christmas program. The biggest hole in my life has been filled now. I am at peace. I have found my church family, and that's been a 14-year journey from another life I experienced before. Thanks to Chip, I am not the same man. I am bigger, brighter, and much lighter. Narongo had a need. And a group of people in Tauranga who were part of the kingdom of heaven, simply by the, who they were, loved him and embraced him. And he met God. This is a newspaper article that appeared in the Toowoomba Chronicle, up behind Brisbane, in the hills behind Brisbane. And it tells the story of Jill, who lost 
27 kilos after attending a CHIP program. That article was seen by Pat Quinn. And Pat Quinn attended the CHIP program, lost a whole pile of weight. I spoke to her a, year, a couple of years ago and we actually recorded a video. And she said, I'm 72, I feel like I'm 50 except for the pain I had in, have in my body. She adopted the CHIP program wholeheartedly. And then she went back to Toowoomba Church and said, please run another CHIP program. And it took four years for Toowoomba Church to walk up the, work up the courage to run another CHIP program. And when they did, Sister Pat Quinn was the um, article in the newspaper that time. And you can see Pat before the CHIP and after CHIP. You can see the dog's got a little bit older, so you can see how long it's progressed there. And this is a picture of the, um, the Seventh-day Adventist CHIP team in Toowoomba. And right in the centre, you can see Pat. And is Pat an Adventist? No, not. she's not. She's a Catholic sister who lives in Toowoomba. And we now have a situation where that's 13 of the 17 people that Sister Pat Quinn personally brought along to the CHIP program in Toowoomba. And our biggest CHIP evangelist in Toowoomba is now a Catholic sister. That's what the Kingdom of Heaven looks like. The Kingdom of Heaven is an autistic boy at the church that I go to. And the youth took the service there um, last year. And one of the young fellas was talking about in the struggle with an addiction he was having. And tears started running down his face, face. And Will grabbed a box of tissues and dumped them on the desk in front of the young fella preaching. And then the next speaker was going to come on. The next speaker happened to be my daughter. And Will said, are you going to cry too? Do I need to get another box of tissues? But that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. The kingdom of heaven is a group of people giving up their Sunday morning to go to Hornsby Mall and conduct a health expo. And I was really moved and inspired to be part of that health expo. And Roger and myself and Dr. David Pennington and um, another doctor whose name's escaped me at the moment. Uh, where are I? I saw her here before. Yeah. Yeah, we're up the front there. We're at the end of that, helping people who had worked through the process. And the conversations and the prayers that I was able to have with those people at the end of that process were just phenomenal. And that's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. The kingdom of heaven is a recipe club. And I must help Marilyn promote the recipe club. When does it start, Marilyn? Next month. Next month, recipe club starting. The kingdom of heaven is the chip programs, which we've seen here, depression and anxiety recovery. The kingdom of heaven is Tony, and I can't see Tony Huda Peter here this morning. But 40 years ago, when I graduated from nursing, and I didn't, wasn't sure where to live, Tony said, come and live with me. He had a flat in Hornsby. And I flatted with him for about three months. And then I had a motorbike accident. And it was a serious motorbike accident. And Tony looked after me and cared for me. And my mum came over and mum went and stayed with Tony. The kingdom of heaven was Tony. The kingdom of heaven is Esther, professor of nursing at the University of West, uh, Western Sydney. And one of, New Zealand, one of Australia's, I should say, top nurse educators. And on a regular basis, Esther sends out emails to all of her contact list with just a, a thought, just a thing. That's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. The kingdom of heaven is, is David taking his holidays to go to Nepal to help release burn strictures in people there that can't get that. The kingdom of heaven is a nurse looking after my father. Her name was Diane. And making sure that the TV station was on the Hope Channel on Sabbath so that dad didn't have to listen to the races on Sabbath. And treating people in that, uh, in that age care with dignity and respect. That's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. What does the kingdom of heaven look like as I work for this Greater Sydney Conference Office? What's it look like for the Seventh-day Adventist Church? What's it look like for the Rankin family? What does it look like for me, Paul Meredith Rankin? What does the kingdom of heaven look like in your workplace, your home, your marriage, in your everyday life? And folks, church is just a collection of those of us who are part of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus puts it very bluntly back again in Matthew chapter 5. And once again, I'm using the message tra um, translation. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. 
In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-breathed identity. Live generously, graciously towards others, the way that God lives towards you. My prayer this morning is that you will be the kingdom. Because you live, Lord, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for that privilege. And Lord, I pray that you will be with us as we come to understand more and more what that means and how we can truly be citizens of your heaven, of your kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. Mm -hmm.